estamos, estamos listos. Bueno, este, es un gran placer tenerte aquí en, en el Centro de Estudios Puertorriqueños. I don't know how, you know, the young people probably don't know uh, the program, but uh, Lloyd is an institution in, in, in medical uh, anthropology and sociology. He actually started the, uh, uh, the field, probably, of, of cultural psychiatry. Certainly Puerto Rico uh, was uh, more than a pioneer. When no one was paying attention to Espiritista, Lloyd was there documenting the healing uh, of uh, uh, of, of kind of native uh, customs uh, uh, of the population. In any case, you know, uh, Lloyd has a long, long pedigree. I, you know, suffice to say that he taught at Yale uh, at Fordham for many years, created a center for Hispanic research, a pioneer. Uh, uh, for when I was a, uh, a graduate student, actually, uh, the center was actually one of the few uh, let's say, hard social sciences producer of uh, content. You know, everybody else was in identity and culture and so forth, and Lloyd found a way to merge the importance of culture into actual uh, social uh, sciences and social research. Uh, he has uh, many, um, has served in many boards and had many appointments, uh, more, m more important than uh, he was in the, a member of the National Institute of Mental Health Council, and he has published uh, uh, several books, including uh, Trapped uh, Families and Schizophrenia, which actually Iris and I were just commenting about uh, not long ago, and The Migrant in the City. And, and, and Barrio Professors actually is a more interesting narrative because it gives you an insight into how, it, uh, into the craft of research and how it is that the great uh, researchers like Lloyd think about uh, problematizing uh, things that are so day-to-day uh, -to -day for other people. So it's a great pleasure. Uh, we're looking forward to your reading. Uh, it's uh, the second time, I think, that, that we have you at Centro here, and I, we hope that uh, we can have you many, many more times. But I'm really looking forward to your reading. I, I was fascinated by all the, uh, the stories. Uh, and for those of you who haven't read the book yet, uh, the, the, the prose is so uh, realistic, to say the least, that as, <laughs> as, as Lloyd is walking through El, El Caño Martin Peña or a psychiatric war, you're there with him. Uh, so hopefully we get some of that tonight. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here. I, I've told it a couple of you folks that I had the pleasure of talking to a few minutes ago that um, one of the very first things that I did when I came to New York City in 1974 was to visit El Centro uh, with Frank Bonilla because I knew Frank from years before and he was a person that from the very beginning, as a matter of fact I was in a committee at Yale uh, at that time and we tried to bring him to, to Yale and uh, uh, he was made a very excellent offer by Yale University, and he, uh, he rejected it. And I said, Frank, why are you rejecting a professorship at Yale? And he said, well, New Haven doesn't have many Puerto Ricans, you know, and I feel very comfortable in New York City. And he wanted to, to uh, he didn't want to leave his community. He, he was a very, very honest, uh, devoted, uh, devoted, uh, person, for those of you who know him, uh, there was something almost hypnotic about his personality and the way he knew how to play uh, the various foundations and approaching them to support his efforts. Uh, by the time he would get through making his presentation, uh, all of the big money guys uh, felt profoundly guilty about the fact that they weren't Puerto Rican <laughs> and they would open up the purse strings and pretty much say, Frank, what is it that you want? Do you want 100,000, 200,000, <laughs> uh, They were, he was an overwhelming uh, person in, in, in a very quiet, uh, sensitive, sensitive way. He was a remarkable person, and I wish him the best. Um, I'm not going to give any lectures today. It would be r ridiculous to attempt uh, lectures. I've given so many lectures, and way over 50 years of academic life. I'm going to tell you stories, one story after another story. 
And I want to tell you a story about a book I recently published, Botrio Professors, and the circumstances that led me uh, to focus on the writing of this book. Uh, this is the first book that I have ever written that I had no statistical tables in front of me, I had no major theoretical statements in front of me, I had none of the usual accoutrements of the methodology of the social sciences. It was, in fact, a book that I had always, in a way, wanted to write, as I'm going to explain to you. It's a, it's a fictionalized um, memoir of my uh, research experiences, uh, starting with uh, the three years uh, that I spent uh, in the slums of uh, San Juan uh, doing the studies that uh, actually led to the publication of uh, Trapped Families and Schizophrenia that some of you uh, are familiar with. And then I went to uh, New Haven, uh, Connecticut, where I was a uh, professor at Yale. And I got immersed in the Puerto Rican community of New Haven and found it f absolutely fascinating to study the transition from Puerto Rico uh, to New York City uh, or to New, uh, to New Haven and the efforts that the Puerto Ricans were making to organize themselves politically. And so I undertook a participant observation study, namely because I had no money. Uh, and, um, and I studied the uh, Hispanic Confederation of New Haven for many years uh, and published a book called Migrant uh, in the City. And of course, there were a whole bunch of articles associated with, uh, with both of those uh, books. But in some respects, this is, uh, this is a book, in, uh, in a way, I don't know, I've enjoyed, uh, I enjoyed uh, writing it. Usually, uh, books are difficult. Uh, Enterprise. If you want to write a good book, you're in for a hard, hard job. There are no, sh there are no really real sh uh, shortcuts. But I always wanted. To, I've always had an interest in fiction for many, many years, and I, have a, I was trying to think my way through. Why is it that I have this absorption in writing fiction to the point where I take a memoir like this and I, there are portions of it that I fictionalize and I can define the ways that I fictionalize it. I draw from my research experiences, but I can't say that the statement is the same kind of an empirical statement that I have published in my other, in my other books. Uh, I was born and raised uh, in Puerto Rico, mostly in Rio Piedras, and, um, and of course Spanish uh, was my original language. But then at the age of 11, uh, in 1941, uh, my family moved to uh, the, United, uh, the United States, uh, and we moved to, from San Juan, Puerto Rico, large extended family, uh, all of the life and vitality uh, of Hispanic culture was gone in this uh, little town, Iowa City, Iowa, cold as hell, oh, <laughs> the winters are of Siberian, uh, of Siberian <laughs> proportions, uh, in the middle of a of a huge cornfield, <laughs> and um, and I had terrible problems of acculturation. Terrible. As a matter of fact, I got thrown out of two schools, and I remember my father looking at me. My father was an American. He had been a professor at the University of Puerto Rico. My father looking at me and saying, "What are we going to do with you, Lloyd? There aren't too many schools left in Iowa City. Uh, two is pretty much what you're entitled to in every way." And he said, uh, "Maybe he was. A, he believed in, in in the power of communication. He said that maybe the trouble is that you don't know English very well, and and I think you ought to try to learn try to learn English. But here, it's not like having an enormous." Hispanic community of two million Hispanics who have in New York City. This is in the isolation of a small academic town, small university town in the middle, uh, middle of Iowa. And he says, uh, I bow to you, Lloyd. Uh, I think that your problem is a problem of, of acculturation. And he even used that word. It's funny because many years afterwards, I've come to try to make theoretical sense out of it, out of it in a whole series of publications, but the central concept that he really had 
was that I had to learn English. If you don't know English, you're not going to be able to connect with the environment because people here in Iowa City don't know Spanish. Not many know Spanish, and you have to you have to learn you have to learn English. So he vowed to me that that everything that I tried to read in English he would discuss with me. And uh, I said everything, and he said yes. So my poor father, who was a very professorial professor, had to discuss with me Dick Tracy, uh, Tarzan. Um, he had to discuss Batman and Robin. He had to discuss the stuff that I read, you see. And we had long discussions of that until he began to get a little bit antsy and restless about spending his time with comic book figures, and he says, why don't you try to read some, um, some serious literature? And I didn't quite know what he meant, and he said, read serious literature, and we took discuss what serious literature was. So I turned then to writings, to the writings I was, I got caught, I wrought, re read uh, at a very early age, I read Hemingway's uh, For Whom the Bell Tolls, that had come out two or three years before to me. To this day, I think it's one of the most magnificent novels ever, ever written. Uh, it's just a gorgeous piece of, of, of work. Uh, I read um, I read Huckleberry Finn, and I became fascinated by Mark Twain. Huckleberry Finn is is really the greatest of all American novels. I think if you had to pick one, that would be that would be Mark Twain was was really our our author. Um, I read um, Charles Dickens' David Copperfield. I love David Copperfield because as the, the, the idiosyncratic characters of David Copperfield kind of reminded me of my crazy family that we had left behind in Rio Piedras, Puerto Rico. Uh, they weren't quite, you know, they were very British, of course, but they didn't quite have the uh, the, 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 the zestful vulgarities <laughs> of my family uh, uh, in, um, in, in Puerto Rico. And, and, and the result was that as a re by reading the serious literature and having long talks with my father, I developed a tremendous admiration for authors of fiction and always wanted to write fiction because in the process of writing fiction, I was acquiring, of, of reading fiction and discussing it, I was acquiring English, and it proved to be uh, extremely, extremely helpful. I admired people who could, who could construct, who could construct uh, these exciting worlds, the Hemingways and the Mark Twains and the Charles and Dickens, and, and how people then, uh, how, the, how they are able to transport persons into those worlds in a, imaginative and creative way. I was determined that I wanted to be a writer of fiction at a fairly early age. But then what happened was that the academic bug bit me when I was uh, uh, in college and uh, uh, I embarked upon an academic career and it took over 50 years that uh, about the, uh, for me then to have the time really more, more than 50 years. Uh, it was in 2002 when I retired. The first thing I said, I want to write now. I've written enough. I've written nine books or eight books. Uh, I, I want to I try fiction. I want to try fiction. And, and, and during retirement, I, I, tried, I tried to write fiction. Um, but I was discouraged from writing fiction by a lot of my colleagues in universities because there is a prevailing view, I don't know how strong it still is, that if you're a sociologist, you can't write fiction. As a matter of fact, many people feel that sociologists don't know how to write. But certainly <laughs> fiction, I mean, to write fiction is, is, uh, is something else. After all, if you're of my generation and you come into the social sciences at a time when the whole positivistic uh, revolution was shaping the character of the social sciences, psychology and sociology, 
you had drilled into your head methodology, 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 all the time. And methodology always boiling down to how do you go about verifying hypotheses that in some way have been derived from some theoretical system. And that was a central focus in the post-war years in graduate training. Therefore, you had to take courses in statistics. Uh, you had to take courses in psychometric uh, analysis. You had to take courses uh, in conceptual analysis. It was all the idea that the social scientists were retarded in their development and they needed to take steps forward to realize themselves scientifically. If you're going to be a science, get busy and do science, you know. And the idea of doing science was essentially converge on the idea of how you go about in the process of inquiry and verification. How do you go about verifying uh, propositions that have some kind of, uh, of uh, theoretical relevance? The idea then was that you couldn't really write fiction if you had all this stuff hammered into your head in a multitude of seminars and conferences and the whole graduate program organized uh, to pound into your head to pound into your head the hard methodology of measurement, 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 and verification. If you have all of that stuff inside your head, how do you go about writing fiction? Because there's something about methodology, the idea was, the idea was that excludes the imaginative thrust that is required in order to do, uh, in order to do, uh, to do, uh, uh, fiction. There was something mutually exclusive and the thoughts of a lot of people, I did not get much encouragement. You'll never be able to do it, Lloyd, because they, uh, you're, you know, you've been hammered into uh, conforming with a positivistic notion of a science. You know, you're all familiar with this, uh, I'm sure, absolutely, because it still, it still goes on, although there's a certain a degree of tipping of the hat toward things like qualitative analysis that enable you to skirt some of the uh, strong uh, admonitions admonitions <laughs> in, fa in favor of measurement, 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 verification, verification. It's something about having that stuff inside your head, it was thought, that would extinguish the creative juices that are required in order to do uh, to do uh, fiction. Um, I was concerned about that. I was anxious about it because some of the people who advocated that position were very respectable. Herman Stein, for example, who was a good friend of mine at Case Western Reserve. Uh, Herman Stein's brother was the guy who wrote the book for uh, Fiddler on the Roof. And Herman Stein used to argue that once you get this social science stuff inside your head, you will never be able to write, to write fiction. I said, are you sure, Herman? Yes. No, you can't, you can't do it. As the time came closer to when I could devote myself to the writing of some fiction, my anxieties increased. And I said, maybe people like Herman and the other ones are right. I, I don't know. And. Uh, I was very anxious about it. So what did I do? I went to the summer sessions at the University of Iowa to learn. This is after writing eight books. I had to learn how to write, how to specifically how to write fiction. So five summers in a row, I went to what is called the Iowa Writers Festival, which has become quite famous. The New York Times seems to have a little article about it every year, very well attended. And if you ever want to see a festival that is not a festival, go to the Iowa Writers, <laughs> Iowa Writers Festival because they work the hell out of you. Uh, it's, there's nothing, there's, there's no festivity involved <laughs> in, in trying to, uh, to hammer out uh, good, clear prose. Iowa has a tradition of lucid and clear mm -hmm. prose. Uh, it sort of reflects the clarity of the cornfields and of the culture and the the, 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 the sense of that uh, an empirical conception of life is really the valid conception of life, you know, observation. But anyhow, 
Uh, I went there five years in a row, and and then uh, as my confidence grew, I, I tried to write a short story and I presented it uh, to people in the seminars that I was attending, and it, it just bombed. I mean, there was, it, it was a terrible story. Um, I tried to write about the uh, about Puerto Rico, and I tried to write about. I had written a lot about the. Uh, role segregation, sex role segregation in Puerto Rican society. You can't help but write about that in the traditional Puerto Rican, Puerto Rico that I studied. Sex role segregation was one of the fundamental aspects of, of life, the differences between men and women. And I chose to write about a woman who had a sexual sickness that was recognized in the community as a, as a folk sickness. She had, uh, she had, uh, she had um, uh, um, a, an agitated vagina is the way that it was said, furor uh, vaginal. She was very, very sick. Uh, and and, and uh, the, uh, when I presented the story, there was an, a, a lady sitting by me who was stunned, shocked, and, and, and she said, uh, uh, I will never read anything that you write. This is, this, is a, this is a complete vulgarity that you're presenting to this seminar, and if you intend to write other things like this, I will never read anything you write. On the other hand, there was a young, attractive lady who said, what's all this business about virginity, you know? So you had these, these opposing views, which are still sort of latent in American culture, trying to work themselves out, but manifested right in that, in that in that uh, in that classroom, um, uh, the, that story uh, bombed. Uh, I, I can't say. Uh, also, I was using too many abstract terms. I think one of the most serious things about learning how to write fiction is you have to get away from uh, uh, from from telling. In the social science, we're always telling people about things. We don't we don't show them. You know, we tell that they had, the, the guy had high anxieties. We don't talk about the trembling hands and the feelings of, of fear that are pervasive, that go into the meaning of, of anxiety. We, we tell all the time without showing. And literature fiction has to show. It has to get into the details of those more abstract concepts that we think about. Uh, and and uh, it, it, was, it was a really bad story. And, and then I decided, no, I, I don't want to do this kind of thing. I want to go back to something that is very familiar to me. I'm going to go back and try to write about my experiences. Uh, early in my professional career, going back to 1957, when I got my PhD uh, in sociology, I went, to, went back to Puerto Rico. I want to write about those experiences I had there. And I'm not going to take I, I write ahead of a little cottage up in Maine where I go and isolate myself every year for five months. And uh, I didn't take any tables. I didn't take any literature reviews. I didn't take any articles. It's a great feeling of freedom for the first time in over 50 years to be able to say, now you've got to, it's got to come out of your head and your memory and so on. And because I had to rely on memory and so on, I can't, just couldn't dignify it as being an accurate uh, historical account, and it's not. It's uh, uh, the very first, first paragraph of Barrio Professors, which is the manifestation of what I was trying to do, uh, announces that it is, it has to be looked upon as fiction, although it derives correctly from my experiences in the field, and I use literary devices to try to organize a lot of what I could recall. But you know, memory is very fallible, too. So anyhow, um, what I want to do, what I want to do is, I want to go back to those years, and I want to read you a little bit from the book, but I want to tell you a little bit about the setting in Puerto Rico. Someone was asking me about the Social Science Research Center at the University of Puerto Rico. So when I got my PhD in 1957, I went back to the University of Puerto Rico and I worked at the Social Science Research Center, which by the way, um, was internationally famous. The Social Science Research Center at that time in Puerto Rico had no equal uh, in terms of prestige. I mean, all of the major, not all of the major, but 
the, many of the major social scientists in the United States wanted to go to Puerto Rico to work at the center because Puerto Rico was, was going through a, 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 tr a tremendous transformation and it was a, attaining a social cultural transformation, economic transformation, not growing out of uh, uh, the gun barrel as the Marxists would argue that good social change has to come out of a gun barrel, but rather coming out of tax abatements, you know, and the whole policy of the, uh, of the uh, local government, you know, to give uh, tax relief to American industries that would start up in Puerto Rico. So it wasn't guns, it was taxes. Uh, and, and, but very clever, uh, very ingenious manipulation of, of, of tax systems and ways of bringing industries into Puerto Rico. Those, those were fascinating years. The years of the 50s in Puerto Rico were years of, of tremendous social change. Uh, uh, Puerto Rico became a, a uh, an urban society in those years. Puerto Rico became an industrialized society in those years. Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico uh, uh, attained commonwealth status. Uh, Puerto Rico, those were years that the, the rate of social change in Puerto Rico at that time was comparable to uh, Japan and was comparable to Israel which were the two countries usually uh, cited uh, for their, the rapidity of, of, of social change. And so American social scientists were fascinated by that. And so we had an array of social scientists who were virtually from the who's who gallery coming to Puerto Rico. Uh, the John Kenneth Galbraith from uh, Harvard, the Lloyd Reynolds uh, from Yale, the Melvin Tumans from Princeton, and on and on and on. And, and I came there right at the middle of this, and I had the opportunity, being bilingual and, and bicultural, I had the opportunity of observing how these top flight social scientists uh, conducted their work in a new and strange country to them. Uh, and I think that the years that I spent there in some way molded a lot of my attitudes that has, have endured throughout my professional lifetime. And I've become tremendously concerned with the whole concept of culture and the issue of cultural sensitivity. As I guess I could tell you, who was my student at Fordham some years ago. Um, uh, by the way, you gave me one of the best compliments I ever had in my life. You told, you said I was a professor who rocked. <laughs> I had to go home and find out what the hell that. Was. <laughs> you still don't understand me too. <laughs> <You remember that? laughs> Anyhow, uh, these guys would come from all from Harvard and Yale, and they came from Chicago, uh, Princeton. They came from Berkeley. They came from from the major university in the United States, and they were going to try to make sense out of Puerto Rican social change. The, 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 it was, the, the center was the place to be, uh, and then the devotion to research and so on. But these guys, uh, they kind of isolated themselves, you know, they, they isolated themselves because they had their own language. They had the language of longitudinal analysis. They had the language of uh, regression equations. Uh, they had the language of, of uh, even of chi-square. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, uh, they, they had their methodological language. And the Puerto Rican scholars of a more traditional bent were stunned and surprised that people, these famous people could come and without knowing, without knowing Spanish, and without knowing history, without knowing the grand traditions of Puerto Rico, it's got a wonderful legacy, um, without knowing any of that. And they could, they could come and do research, pick up their findings literally and go back to the stateside universities and analyze the data and, and publish it. It was what has come to be known as safari research. Mm -hmm. You go to a strange country, you shoot the game, you come back and you ex exhibit the game, you know, on the walls of your living room. Uh, well, instead of that, you have your books and your articles uh, um, uh, up there. 
and it, it had a safari character. And, and wonder, uh, it still raises a very interesting question. Is it possible, is social science methodology something that can ever compensate for cultural ignorance? Or ignorance of the history and traditions of a country is a very, very profound question, and one that, uh, in some respects, I've tried to make a contribution to it through my own, through my own writings. But in this mix, I found myself uh, between the Puerto Rican local Puerto Ricans who were critical of the Americans and the Americans who were involved in this type uh, of research, and. Um, I have one reading from Barrio professors that I want to present to you that tries to encapsulate some of the issues that were involved at that time um, at the Social Science Research Center, because in many respects I was in between both ways. I was identified with much about American methodology and social science. I knew the Americans as a day-by-day uh, everybody a colleague, on the other hand, a, a, a role conflict. Uh, I had my Puerto Rican friends who I respected very, very much and had, you know, they were part of my social uh, network. And one of them is a person I call Pedro, and he appears in Barrio Professors. And let me tell you a little bit about Pedro, and now I'm going to start reading uh, some excerpts from Barrio Professors, and I will try to give you the context of it. When Pedro stood up to speak in the classroom at the University of Puerto Rico and at faculty meetings, he was poised and elegant. Everyone listened to him, for he was revered by his independentista colleagues and respected by persons of other political persuasions. Independentistas were very, very strong in the University of Puerto Rico campus at that time. Of average height, with a thin body, skin the color of caoba, intense dark eyes, slick jet black hair that matched his predilection for dark suits, he could easily have been an Argentinian tango dancer. Um, when he spoke, he always began with a slight stammer that attracted the listener's attention. Graceful sentences would then parade out of his mouth, each one carefully constructed. His command of Spanish and English had no equal in the faculty that celebrated the spoken word, nor did he have an equal in the faculty in his knowledge of Puerto Rican history and culture. All of the relevant books had been read, an impatient friend once admonished him, for Christ's sake, Pedro, stop reading for a moment and sit down and write a book. Students flocked to hear him, and limits had to be imposed on the enrollment in his classes. The early arriving students monopolized the front rows. Most were long-haired, voluptuous Puerto Rican girls, and their protruding breasts straining to birth through low-cut blouses. When his eyes inadvertently met theirs, they reacted with shy smiles that appeared very well rehearsed. No matter the topic of his lecture, they wanted front row seats. The story was that Pedro remained an all but because he was fearful of the long hours of isolation that are required to write a PhD dissertation. The solitude would also rob him of the daily satisfactions of campus sidewalk talks with other independentistas. Political talk was all over the uh, university, and he was really one of the strongest leaders of all. The concern was that this ignorance, uh, oh, important topics were addressed in such talks, a frequent one being the American researcher's ignorance of Puerto Rican culture. The concern was that this ignorance reflected in the research-based publications emanating from the center would spread distortions about nuestra manera de ser, the Puerto Rican way of being. Independentistas therefore fashioned themselves to be the unofficial guardians of Puerto Rican culture. Often they protected the culture by resorting to blunt personal criticisms. Lloyd. Your intelligence is being clouded by the North American social scientists. It is being warped. You listen to them so much, your brain is going to melt away like Don Quixote did from reading all those books on medieval nights. Pedro said to me one day, when we met by accident on the campus, I had not requested an evaluation of my intelligence, but this did not stop him from volunteering one. 
No, Pedro, to the contrary. I am learning a lot from them, I replied, curtly, not wanting to encourage further talk. I can't talk now because I'm on my way to a meeting with a professor who has been, I found him annoying, so he wanted to sidestep and move on with my work. Another one arriving, another one of these Americans arriving. Which one is he, he asked. He's supposed to be a hell of a methodologist. He is so well regarded that Paul Lazarsfeld is giving him an appointment at Columbia to teach graduate research methods. Paul Lazarsfeld was a guru of methodology in American sociology at that time. No one compared to Paul Lazarsfeld. He knew everything, everything about methodology. And this gentleman was, uh, he's supposed to be a hell of a methodologist. Uh, he's going to teach gradual research methods in sociology, I replied, wanting to divert Pedro from launching another insult. Lloyd, who the hell cares what Lazarfell is doing, he said. That new professor you're going to meet, is he the one who is supposed to study neighborhoods in the lower class here in Puerto Rico? Yes, I, I think so. Por favor, te ruego. You tell me what qualifies him to study Puerto Rican neighborhoods, he asked, dramatizing his sarcasm. He did many studies of neighboring in Minnesota and is considered an expert on how people get together as neighbors. He even developed a scale for the measurement of neighboring. The scale has been psychometrically tested and it has good reliability. Reliability, <laughs> Lloyd, that is mierda. <laughs> and they call it methodology. The question is, what the hell does he know about neighboring in Puerto Rico? He will know after the study. That is what research is all about, to find out about things. I said, beginning to see the usual attempt to put me on the defensive. But he will be using the scale on neighboring to find out, no? Yes, that is right, I replied. Have you studied the assumptions of the professor's neighboring scale, the one you say is so psychometrically reliable? He asked, again, disrespectfully sarcastic. If this shithead knows so damn much, why couldn't he finish his dissertation, I asked myself. <laughs> no, I have not studied the scale's assumption. Have you, I replied, attempting a rhetorical reverse to put him on the defensive. Yes, I have studied them carefully, he replied, and suddenly he had the advantage. I suddenly recalled his habit of scrutinizing the methods used by the center's prestigious American researchers. He did careful homework so he could share disdainful but informed opinions with his sidewalk independentista cronies. Please tell me, what did you conclude, I asked. I concluded that re the reliability of the skull meant nothing because it has no validity in Puerto Rico. See, we also know the vocabulary of methodology, he said, scoring another point. Please explain yourself. Con placer. Lloyd, let me ask you some questions that are in the scale. Please tell me, do lower class Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico have evening barbecues as they drink their martinis? No, of course they don't, I replied, knowing he had thrown in martinis to sharpen his sarcasm. Mm -hmm. Do they get together to discuss the quality of their local school system? No, I don't believe that is what they discuss. Do they get together to organize neighborhood groups to babysit their children? No, they don't. In Puerto Rico, the family or other relatives babysit when it is necessary. You don't need to go on with the questions I ask. I, I get the point. Lloyd, each of your answers is right. Thank you, Pedro. From you, that is a compliment, I said, attempting to return sarcasm. Now, however, I wanted to counter his penchant for always criticizing the research of North American social scientists. Pedro, unfavorable criticism is easy to spew out because it is just a string of words out of your mouth. With words, everything is easy. But what would you do to improve the research? Como dicen en Puerto Rico, con la boca es un mame. By the way, I use all the uh, expressions in Puerto Rico. I, I consider vulgarities part of data. Uh, I don't censor my uh, my reports uh, in that way at all. So Pedro replies to me. He says, um, when I ask him, but what would you do to improve the research? He says, I would start off by wiping my ass with that scale and then throwing it down the hole of a latrine. I grimaced. 
You think that criticism, that criticism is too harsh? Then let me think. Seriously, I would become part of the neighborhood and make observations to try to understand how the families relate to each other. I interrupted him because he was headed for the usual tedious lecture on the importance of using anthropological methods. The lecture always concluded with an attack on questionnaire-based research and with championing the participant observation method. Accordingly, I reminded him that the new professor was a sociologist and scales were prominent in sociological research. Yes, Lloyd, we know sociologists like to use questionnaire-based scales because then they can easily quantify variables and test their precious hypotheses, he replied with a condescending tone. Pedro, please slow down your destructive criticism. It is, if it is possible, try to do something that is constructive. Once again, how would you improve the new professor's neighboring scale, I asked, convinced that he was incapable of an answer. He would be left spinning in silent confusion. Good question, Lloyd. I would tell the professor to learn Spanish first and then study the traditions of neighboring among lower class Puerto Ricans, he answered. Easy answer, Pedro, maybe even a cheap answer. Be specific. Remember, the professor has to adapt the scale to Puerto Rican culture. Of, of course, adaptations are important, but you know very well that most of those st stateside researchers don't even make adaptations. He stopped for a moment to reflect, and his dark eyes were moist. He said, both of us are Puerto Rican, and we have known each other for a long time. Why should we always be arguing about the cultural insensitivity of American researchers? Insensitivity should be their problem, not ours. I was touched by the emotion he was trying to convey, and for a fleeting moment, I felt the bonds of our friendship. I felt conciliatory. We had been good friends, old friends, but we always seemed to be arguing about the same topic. Lately, the arguments had grown bitter. The thing is that I feel an obligation to help, I said, recognizing my admission that the American researchers needed help. You said he was a hell of a methodologist. Tell him to develop a new scale, a Puerto Rican neighboring scale. A new scale? Yes, a new scale, he replied. The new professor could start with the abundant literature in the Puerto Rican collection that is in our library a block away from here, he said while pointing in the general direction of the library. He should read history, novels, poetry, and the essays written by our own philosophers who have examined Puerto Rican life. That's a tall order for a busy sociologist, I replied. Tall order? Come on, Lloyd. Research is not done hastily. It is a serious matter, and our indigenous culture is very rich. I am curious. If he were to go to the library, what do you think he would find out? I asked, pressing him to be more specific. I know the literature and I can tell you that he, what he would find out. He would find out that the lower class Puerto Rican traditions of neighboring are based on survival. Families share their neighbors in order to survive, share with their neighbors in order to survive because we have a history of desperate poverty. The gringos neither understand nor care about our poverty. Please, one rule or I will leave right now. Keep your independentista politics out of this discussion. You have a tendency to always intrude with your politics, I replied. Perdona, Lloyd. Excuse me, you are right. And his eyes moistened again. For a moment, I forgot that we, that we are having a serious talk about methodology. <laughs> he said, slowly stringing out the syllables of the word, attempting to mock it. I would tell the professor that neighbors in rural Puerto Rico often even share an egg or 10 cents of lard, or a piece of hard bread, or a bucket of water from the hillside stream. I would tell him that in time of need, neighbors adopt and raise each other's children, as hijos de crianza. I would tell him to base the scale on how families cooperate for survival. Presumably, he's aware that in sociology, this is known as the folkways of the poor. In other words, make it valid to our culture. Pedro, that is an interesting recommendation. Muchas gracias. I will convey it to him in a few minutes when I see him. I said, honestly impressed by the insightfulness of the recommendations. But I wondered also if I could ever win an argument from this guy. <laughs> Another thing Pedro said, 
Tell him to forget that business of backyard barbecues between neighbors when he studies desperately poor people. Barbecue in sizzling states is what middle class families do in Minnesota. I was late for my appointment, but Pedro, knowing that he had won another argument, held on for the last word. Lloyd, remember one thing. American social scientists are governed by the dictatorship of the questionnaire. That was uh, the literary effort to bring, to bring together uh, to bring together a lot of very subtle issues involved in transposing instruments from one culture to another. Yes. Well, let me read you something. Um, you mentioned my work in uh, mental health. Uh, let me read you about Doña Juana at the Manicomio of Puerto Rico. Uh, I do have another reading from Don Paco, who is a guy who jolted me. Uh, he, Don Paco is another composite, but a very powerful person. The guy. No, I like Doña Juana better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. He, 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 he's a powerful one. Very powerful. Let, me, let me read you about Doña Juana. Uh, uh, Doña Juana was a person um, that I met out in the field. Uh, when a psychiatrist who worked uh, in our project uh, uh, recommended that I go uh, meet with her. And Doña Juana was a very interesting person. First of all, her appearance was out of the world. She was a woman at least 6'4", six, 6'5", six, tall. And you know, that's very tall very uh, by Puerto Rican standards. Yeah. You, I mean, a big skinny woman. And then on top of her head, uh, of her red hair, her red hair was layered. So I gave her additional height. I don't know, there were three or four layers, almost like sedimentation, you know, <laughs> on top of her head. And she walked very straight. And in this, she was a very serious person. And I got to know her when I was trying to pretest some portions of the study. Uh, now, the setting of this is the manicomio. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Manicomio of Puerto Rico. Uh, the Manicomio of Puerto Rico is an institution with rich symbolisms of stigma. When I was a kid, if you ever misbehaved, they said, Tú estás loco, te van a meter al manicomio. And the manicomio was this dismal, sort of reddish, yellowish, tintish building with red clay surrounding it. And there were all these poor people who were mostly sort of burned out schizophrenics or burned, people burned out with very serious uh, uh, brain disorders of one kind. There was an old guy there who had been there since the uh, Spanish, uh, uh, the Spaniards were, were in control of Puerto Rico, had a beard way down. I mean, it, it was really a, a disheveled, filthy place. Actually, uh, he, it, anything that you read about asylums and the literature on mental health would apply many ways to the manicomio of Puerto Rico, it's a terrible institution. And, and, and um, I went there because they had just started for the first time an outpatient clinic to receive people from the community to give them, uh, to give them therapy. Uh, Puerto Rico had never had a psychiatric facility for people of the lower socioeconomic levels. People, if you were crazy, that was a the interesting thing about our study of schizophrenia, the TRAP study, these people had never really been through any kind of psychiatric psychiatric uh, care. No, it, it wasn't available. Structurally, it wasn't. This, is, this was years before the community mental health movement, which uh, then uh, years afterwards swept through the through the island. I had the pleasure of being very much involved in the development of that because I really believe in the, uh, in the need for it. Okay. When Doña Juana ambled into the room, her long skirt sweeping the floor, her eyes were downcast again, much as they had been during my first interview with her. Inspecting her file, Dr. Barillo, he was a psychiatrist who had just come to Puerto Rico, trained at the Psychoanalytic Institute here in New York, <laughs> Colombia. Uh, Dr. Barillo asked her how she was feeling. He repeated the question. Neither person looked at the other as she sat down. I feel divinely well, she replied, still looking at the floor. 
Divinely well? What do you mean divinely well? This is the doctor speaking. His surprise surprised me. He put the file down and slowly scanned the layers of orange hair, orange hair at the top of her long body stretched on the chair. He looked at the plantain stains on the blouse and the heavy wool skirt drooping on the floor. Yes, divinamente bien. She repeated, her charcoal eyes still fixed on the floor. Entonces, then, if you feel divinely well, por favor, tell me, what the hell made you come here? He asked. Was this polite pretense for interviewing Poi? I asked myself. Because that hijo de la gran puta, perdone me, I mean my husband, <laughs> he forced me to come here to this house of locos. He said he would punch my face if I did not dress quickly to come here. Her eyes were still riveted on the floor. Senora, this is not a house of locos. This is a therapeutic community. I mean, when you use that word therapeutic community, in this <laughs> I, had, I, I had read, I knew the literature on therapeutic community at that time. And when he goes, I was just about, well, anyhow. That, a, participant, a participant observer has got the suppression in his feelings all the time. Senora, this is not a house of locals. This is a therapeutic community, said Dr. Badelio. You should have cooperated with your husband. You have many symptoms. The preliminary interview shows that you hear and see things that are not there. You have insomnia and are tired and withdrawn and sad. Those are symptoms? He asked, oblivious to the embarrassment her interruptions caused the nurse and the guard. Symptoms like when one is sick? Yes, precisely, replied the psychiatrist. Well, then mine are not symptoms. Not symptoms? asked Dr. Badillo. Señora, usted es doctora. You are not a doctor, and you do not know the meaning of the word symptoms. Those are symptoms. They are symptoms of mental disorder. But I am the one, but I'm the one who's having the symptoms. <laughs> yes, it may appear that you, that way to you, but technically you are in denial about being ill, seriously ill. And we have the responsibility of treating you. And patients in his voice indicated that this was no interview employee. Denial? No entiendo. I have not denied anything. Diga me, what have I denied? asked Doña Juana, her intense black eyes now focusing on the psychiatrist. Not once had she addressed him as doctor, nor had she even used the disrespectful usted pronoun. Puerto Rico is a place with respect, very powerful patterns of respect, and to talk the way that she was talking to the doctor was something stunning to everyone else in the room, everyone else in the room. No, I'm not. Um, you're seriously ill. No, I'm not. What? I know you're a scientist and you know about material things, but, uh, but my difficulties are not material. My neighbor, a woman of seriousness, believes I have una causa espiritual, mm -hmm. a spiritual problem. I am being tested by pruebas. I must overcome the pruebas to develop my facultades. Senora, I have a room full of patients waiting on the other side of that door, said Dr. Badillo, pointing to the door. And some have come from as far as Ponce and Mayagüez to see me. Usted debe comprender, you should understand, he lectured, that I'm not going to spend my time talking about spirits. He turned to Doña Juana's medical file, leaned over, toward the nurse and muttered, I am putting down a tentative diagnosis of schizophrenia, a schizophrenic reaction, schizoaffective type, and I am recommending the electroshock series. Electrochoque? <laughs> que? Doña Juana asked in Spanish, electrochoque is difficult to mutter quietly in Spanish. You are asking about the treatment? It is a treatment for persons who have psychotic symptoms that are accompanied by clinical depression. The procedure is simple. A mild electrical current is passed through the patient's brain and it produces convulsions and then temporary amnesia. It <laughs> appears to relieve symptoms of depression, explained the psychiatrist, and cleared his throat to be, to be heard more clearly. Research findings indicate that simple, con la boca humame, Doña Juana interrupted. The nursing guards looked astonished. I think I did too. My sympathy was with Doña Juana, but I had never heard of 
uh, doctor addressed so disrespectfully. She was telling him that difficult or painful experiences are easy when you just say them with your mouth, mm -hmm. with your boca, as easy as the taste of the tropical fruit mame. Translated roughly, words are cheap. Senora, you do not understand. Research demonstrates that electroshocks do not appear to leave enduring. Again, she interrupted. Electrochoque, you should have heard what a man in the waiting room said, that they, a man they call Julian. He said that electrochoque is like being put on the electric chair the way Americans do to criminals. That was a com very common stereotype in Puerto Rico. That, you know, Americans are quick to put people on the, ele <laughs> on the electric uh, chair and, you, uh, and uniquely treat people to the <laughs> electric chair. Uh, you know, Puerto Rico outlawed um, uh, corporal mm -hmm. punishment many years ago. Uh, Americans, he said that the, here in the manicomio, doctors use it to punish the locals. Senora, you are wrong, absolutely wrong. Por favor, please pardon me for correcting you, but everything that has come out of your mouth this morning is wrong. Please understand, I, I mean, the, the, the clumsiness of the therapeutic process that this guy pretends was just outrageous. Mm -hmm. uh, I must tell you that this was true at that time. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, Doña Juana, Doña Juana wants to tell him, so she's telling him about Julian, who's a person he, she met outside the, outside the room. She said, Julian told us from his own experience that they take you into a room with six or eight persons and strap you down on a board of wood about the size of a door. The board has thin padding. They put something in your mouth to keep you from biting off your tongue. The doctors walk behind each patient from one to the next with a machine that looks like those battery chargers used in the gasoline stations. You know those old gas mm -hmm. <laughs> battery chargers that they would wheel up to mm -hmm. the car. Mm -hmm. uh, he wheels the machines in back of you as another person holds the wires on your temples. Then lightning explodes inside your head. You see a darkness swirling around. Then you see nothing and there is silence. You wake up and your body hurts all over and you feel weak and nauseous and cannot remember anything. In the weeks that followed, I found that Julian's description was correct but incomplete. The patients were not anesthetized before being shocked, not even tranquilized. The violence of the electrically induced convulsions caused many patients to defecate and often broke their bones, particularly the ribs under the straps. And the very last person to receive electrochoques while strapped down helplessly already had witnessed, with ever-growing panic, the convulsions of each previous person. Yo no soy loca, she said directly at the, at the doctor. I'm not a loca and I'm not going to be punished and I'm not going to be electrocuted. The facultades I'm developing will not be destroyed. Facultades destroyed? He says, facultades are these... Uh, mystical antennas that put you in contact with the metaphysical world of spirits, you see. Facultades destroyed? Who said anything about destroying facultades, asked Dr. Badillo. His next question also remained unanswered. How can one destroy something that does not exist? I followed Doña Juana out of the room as another patient was being brought in. Professor said, Doña Juana, I am worried. I need to talk to the woman of seriousness and great dignity, the spiritualist medium. I must tell her that my husband and these people in the Manicono do not believe I am developing facultades. They think I am a loca and they want to punish me as a loca. My husband will continue to think I am a loca as long as he sits on the mother's lap. I am married to a ventriloquist dummy. encima del baú, they say in Spanish. I, ther I certainly don't think you are a loca, I said, my voice uncontrollably tremulous. She said, I don't beat my children or attack my neighbors or other people. I don't hit my husband, even though he slugs me. I have never raised a hand against my mother-in-law, although as you have seen, she is the gran puta who started all of this. Also, I don't bear myself naked in front of those persons, not even in front of my husband. In my entire life, I have kissed only the hands of priests, and that has been when I was much younger. In my neighborhood, I'm known as a decent person, a person of respect. I stay at home. 
In other words, she's denying the locura image, you see, that she's very concerned about because she's being treated like a loca because that's what the manicomia does. It punishes locos with electric shock. She's going through. This is a recitation of every dimension of stigma associated with the role uh, of the loca. I intruded and I said, I said, uh, I could see when I visited your neighborhood last week that you're highly regarded. I added, she says, I am conforme. My life has been sad, but I am conforme. It is just that now I have to confront pruebas to develop my facultades, and sometimes the pruebas fatigue me. I wanted to express my sympathy again, but at that moment, her husband and mother-in-law arrived just as the ever-increasing dark clouds burst into a tropical downpour. We scurried in different directions. Sheets of swirling rain made it difficult even to see the manicomio's nearby entrance. A flash of lightning revealed that the green pajama barefooted inmates in the front yard were in flight, no longer meandering, sprinting to cover with surprising speed and agility, sprinting for cover with surprising speed and agility. The continuous roar of thunder was like the rapid fire salvos of a battleship stationed over the manicomio. My clothes pasted on me by the rain. I hurried through the now empty cavernous waiting room, dripping water <coughs> on the pools of water still there from the cleaning women. Um, this is, uh, if you, if you want to look at this uh, in a literati way, which is of course the way I've been trying to look at my writings and what I've been trying to do, this is sort of a, an instance, this is a summary statement of literally hundreds of participant observation acts, you see, and it's, it's what you might call compressed reality. It's a word that I've, a concept that I've been trying to develop, compressed reality. When you write, you have to be more real than reality. You have to etch it. You can't allow yourself the luxury of the languid unfolding of events, because you're going to lose the reading. It's compressed reality. Hemingway was master at this, and he said himself that writing, in writing fiction, you had to be more, more real than reality. And, and, and for whom the bell tolls, he talks about uh, sexual relations between the, the hero, uh, whose name is Jordan, and Maria, the uh, guerrilla girl. And he talks about when they're having sexual relations, the earth moved and it felt like death. That's what he says, it's compressed, re etching it so that it's strong uh, and vivid. And it's what I tried to do in this particular excerpt. Mm -hmm. Kind of a daguerreotype, you know, uh, as much as possible. So, so I, I, I try to learn, you know, from my own readings and from my experiences at um, the Iowa Writing Festival <laughs> the festivities of the Al Writing, writing uh, Festival, uh, how to look at things in a literary way, uh, not in a statistical way, not in a methodological way, in order to convey real life experiences. And I come to believe that there's tremendous truth in literary productions. And I do believe, by the way, uh, many, many years ago I taught methodology at Yale University uh, to graduate students, that if I had to go back and do methodology again for these uh, very bright students, I would insist that after they conducted their research, they attempt to write about it in narrative form, because the, the attempt to narrate itself gives you tremendous new and, and I think quite lucid perceptions uh, of the subjects that you are addressing through your research, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to work toward the relationship between, between fiction and, and research. What are the ways that these things can be related? That's what I'm working on right, right now. Thank you very much.